Hello, Math Study students, and welcome to another online lesson. Today we'll be continuing our discussion on symbolic logic, and we'll be learning some new vocabulary related to that. In addition, we'll be talking about the project a little bit, specifically with regard to um, uh, data collection, our next assignment for the, uh, the project. Uh, some vocabulary we'll talk about are if-then statements, also known as implications, uh, as well as the equivalence symbol, and we'll talk about what inverse, converse, and contrapositive mean. But to get started with, we will take a look at the project. So for the project, we need to gather some data. Um, you can do this any number of ways. You could literally get data uh, from a source on the internet or research it some other way, or you can actually go out and collect the data yourself. My recommendation, especially if you're doing a chi-squared project, which is what, again, what I would recommend for a uh, sake of ease, is that we, um, that we write a survey. That way you're getting the data, you know who got it, you know where it came from, and you were able to control some of the situations involved in getting that. Uh, it works well for a chi-squared analysis. So that's what I'm going to talk about in great detail. But I also know that some students have said they wanted to write a partial survey in conjunction with uh, a test or a quiz, and you can do that as well. Uh, if you have a source that you want to get data from on the internet, that's fine, um, and I'll talk about that. But again, most of us will be writing surveys, I imagine. I think students have fun writing that, um, and I think they are able to put a little bit more of themselves into it, find a little bit more interest as far as their project goes when they do that. So uh, with regard to the survey, I suggest you write a four to five question survey. Each one of those questions should only address one of your variables, and likely you only have two variables for a chi-squared analysis. So you will look at some of your topic or one of your uh, variables in more than one way. Um, for example, let's say we were dealing with gender. Well, gender kit is a very simple concept. It can only be asked two ways, or one way, I'm sorry, you should say, are you male, female? And that's it. But notice that if my topic is gender versus, say, uh, hair length, I would write questions about hair length or I would write questions about gender. I would not mix and match the two. So again, each question can only address one of your variables. Obviously, you want to have questions address both of them, but each individual question, one variable at a time. And so again, obviously, you'll have some questions that deal with the same variable um, if you're writing four questions, maybe two for each one of your variables if you can make that happen. And it'll make for a more interesting uh, analysis if you can look at your study using multiple questions as opposed to a very basic study which would only be two questions long. All questions should be multiple choice. This ensures that your data is categorical. So if you're using quantitative numbers you should turn them into uh, multiple choice groupings so that you can actually use a chi-squared analysis. If you're not using chi-squared analysis, again, you're going to need some other sophisticated math in order to do that, and hopefully you've spoken to me already about that. Um, when you're writing your choices, make sure that everyone taking your survey has a choice. Don't say, oh, I am skip this question if you, uh, you know, answered no to the previous one or something like that, unless you're not planning on using that person's data at all. They need to be able to answer all of the questions or have an appropriate way of doing that. Um, so a lot of times putting a multiple choice of other, you know, what, which of the following do you most prefer? And they don't fit in with any of those categories, so they still have something they can put down. Or having zero as an option um, when you talk about things like how many hours do you work per week? Uh, and you list different hours, but then someone doesn't have a job. So they would work zero hours a week. Things like that. You need to make sure that, again, there's an appropriate choice for everybody who might be taking your survey. Now, if your survey is only geared towards male students, and uh, then you don't need to put choices in for female students other than maybe a question at the top saying, what's your gender, just to simply weed out the ones that would be inappropriate. Um, avoid questions that show bias. Bias is a way of um, showing your own feelings on something. So you don't want to use adjectives or something like that in the question that would imply that it's distasteful, their answer. Uh, this can be very difficult when it comes to things like 
uh, grades or performance. We want to word things in a more clinical way so that um, our data is not um, unreliable. Finally, when you submit this assignment, um, I want you to put your statement of task at the top. You don't need to have that statement of task when you actually hand out your surveys eventually, but when I read the survey, I want to know what your survey is based on without having to look through other documents. So for the sake of my ease, um, and, uh, and then for the benefit of you, when we discuss your surveys, and we will, um, please put your statement of task right at the very top and then followed by your uh, four to five questions. In addition to all of this, along with your questions, I want you to explain why you need them. What's the point of the question? So you're going to start off with your statement of task at the top. You're going to write your four to five questions. And then explain why you need each question. If you can't explain why you need it, maybe you don't need it at all. And maybe it's time to write a different question. Or maybe you have enough. So that's what I'm looking for in this assignment. A statement of task, four to five questions, and explaining uh, why you need each question. So you could maybe do that in four to five well-written sentences to explain one for each question. Um, if you do not plan on writing a survey, you're not doing chi-squared or whatever the case is, um, then for this assignment, all I need you to do is explain what you, how you are getting your data. If you're using a website or some other source, please cite that so that I can view that and see where the data is coming from if it's not coming from a, um, a survey that you've created. Um, again, some people mentioned that they will be writing quizzes to give out to people and using that to collect data in conjunction or in lieu of a survey. Awesome. If you're doing that, again, I'd like to see that quiz. I want to see whatever data collection tool you are using. I don't actually need to see the data yet, but again, whatever tool you are using, whether that be survey, quiz, or whatever. But again, I think most of us will have the most enjoyment, the most success, and uh, the greatest amount of ease by uh, writing a survey. But again, I am not telling you that you have to do that. You can do whatever you want. Um, but I still need it submitted so that I can... Uh, check it off. Uh, last but not least, the surveys uh, slash data collection tools are due November 18th and 19th, which would be this upcoming Monday and Tuesday for A and B days respectively. And they should be uploaded to the SLC by the beginning of class on each of those days. Um, and uh, there will be a uh, place on the SLC to upload those. All right, so that wraps up our project talk. We're now going to uh, talk about symbolic logic. More symbols. We've got something known as an implication. An implication is basically an if-then statement. We've used if-then statements all the time. We hear them from our parents and things like that. If you clean your room, then you can go out. Uh, if you do not make enough money, then you cannot buy the things you want. If and then, sort of a cause and effect type of uh, relationship. The symbol for if then is sort of a hybrid between an arrow and an equal sign. So equal sign, two lines parallel right on top of each other, and then an arrowhead. It's not a single line arrow. If you use that, that is incorrect. Um, it's two lines, like an equal sign with an arrowhead. No other version is appropriate. Um, I see crazy things that I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but it's not an arrow. It's an equal sign with an arrow. And so uh, we read this. Again, we have our P and our Q, which are both propositions, which we know from our last lesson just means a statement. And if you see two propositions with the imply symbol or the implication symbol in between them, you start off by actually using the word if. Before you read the P statement at all, or the P proposition, you say if, and then whatever P said, and then you put a then where the symbol was, and then followed by the Q. Um, the P, the if part of our statement, is called the antecedent, and the Q part, the secondary part, is called the consequent. 
I probably won't use those words a whole lot, but again, I want to make sure that you've seen them so that if they're ever mentioned in a problem, again, the question won't be what is the antecedent, but they might refer to the antecedent and then you won't know what they're talking about. So it's alphabetical. Antecedent comes first, consequent comes second. Also consequence, uh, the word consequence is something that you get after you do an action. And so that can also help you remember those. And we'll look at an example of this coming up. Um, there are different kinds of implications. Um, well, I guess one thing I should add before I move on. Um, when you see this uh, equal sign with the arrowhead, it's red implies, and I know I have that written here. P implies Q. Um, or you could read it as if P then Q. But again, implies is what this symbol can be read as. But in uh, a written out sentence, you're going to see the words if and then. And again, the weird thing is this symbol actually puts the if in front of the letter in front of it. Okay. Now, there are three different kinds of special if-then statements. So if we're given a statement, if P, then Q, or P implies Q, there's something known as the converse of it. And if you take a careful look here, they look like they're the same at first, but you'll notice that the Q and the P are in a different spot than they were here. They flip-flopped. And that is the converse. So you switch the order of your consequent and antecedent. The inverse of the statement, you'll notice if I have if P then Q, or P implies Q, P is still first, Q is still second, but I've negated both of my propositions. So now it's saying if not P, then not Q. And finally, you've got the contrapositive. And again, if our original statement is if P then Q, or P implies Q, then what we do here is you'll notice the Q came first and the P came second, so we switched the order, and we also negated them. So you're doing two things for the contrapositive. Do you need to know this? Yes. Is it in your formula packet? No. So you actually need to know what these things are, and I will tell you how I remember them. You've got the two short words, the ones that are the easiest ones to mix up, I think, inverse and converse. Converse... When I think of that, it reminds me of the shoe company. And after 35 years of putting on shoes, I'm pretty good at them. I don't have to think very much when I'm putting on my shoes. But the one thing I still need to check is the order. I need to make sure that, you know, I'm putting the left shoe on the left foot and the right shoe on the right foot. So which one goes right and which one goes left is important when it comes to the converse. And so we switch the order. We think about order just like we would when putting on shoes, the one on the left is important, the one on the right, and again, we switch that order for converse. Inverse is the other one. So if converse is the one where you switch the order, then inverse is the other one. So that means you don't switch the order, you just switch the signs. Contrapositive doesn't sound anything like the other ones. It's got five syllables for the other ones only have two. It's a much bigger word, more syllables, and so you got to do more stuff. What do we have to do? We have to switch the order of the P and the Q, and we have to do the negations. So once again, converse, think of shoes. The order is important. Which one is left and which one is right? So you switch the order for converse. Inverse is the other short one, so you're not switching order. You're just negating each one. Each side, notice, gets negated. And then contrapositive, once again, is the one you do the most stuff. Why? Because it's the biggest word. So you not only switch like you do on the converse, but you also negate like you do on the inverse. Last but not least, there's something known as an equivalent. Two statements are equivalent if one implies the other and vice versa. So equivalence is denoted by the symbol here, the equivalent symbol. It can be read if and only if. And you don't put the F out front. This you would just read, you know, the P statement, if and only if, the Q statement. And it's made with an equal sign with an arrowhead on both sides. All right, let's look at a couple examples here. So given the statements, it is Friday is our first proposition, P. Our second proposition is Q. Mr. Peacock is happy. Write the following in sentences. So the first one, P implies Q. 
Again, if we're going to write this in words, our imply symbol is written with an if and a then. We put the if out first. If I see that symbol in between the two, I don't start by writing the P statement. I start by writing if. And then I write whatever my P statement is, then the then, and then my Q statement or my Q proposition. So if it is Friday, then Mr. Peacock is happy. Um, so that is our, uh, our original statement. Now we want to do the inverse of that. Well, inverse is not the shoe company, so that's not the order that's important, and it's the other small one, so we must just have to negate. So all we do is put a negation with each of our statements. It's still an if then, so now I write if it is not I'm underlining just to show you. You don't have to underline yours. If it is not Friday, then Mr. Peacock is not happy. And notice there's a not there as well. There's a not for each one of our statements. Okay, moving on to the next one, contrapositive. Contrapositive of P implies Q. It's the big word, the one that my spell check doesn't like. So I need to do two things. I need to switch the order, like on the converse, and I need to get and negate both of my statements uh, or propositions just like on the uh, inverse. So I'm going to say if... Starting now with the Q statement, Mr. Peacock is not happy, then it is not Friday. Notice there is a not in each one of my propositions, and... Um, and I have switched the order of the original statement. Again, I'm not in each one of them. All right, now we've got the converse. Converse is like the shoe, so I'm going to switch the order. If Mr. Peacock is happy, then it is Friday. There's no knots involved in a converse. It's just a switching of the order. I put Q first and then P. Last but not least, we have the uh, equivalence. It is Friday. If and only if Mr. Peacock is happy. And I don't think I actually need a comma here. Uh, if you did, you could probably separate the whole little clause there, if and only if, with commas. But it is extremely important that you have a capitalization at the beginning of the sentence and a period at the end. Uh, in order to get full credit on these statements. All right. So some book work on page 246 and 248, and we will see you next time.